Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sophia. I was born and raised in a small country in the Middle East by the name of Kuwait. I was raised right in front of a mosque where I would hear the call to prayer five times a day. Growing up in a Muslim home, uh, it was very important to my family and I that we worshipped the Creator God, Allah, follow the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, and very devote our lives to following the five pillars of Islam as well. From the age of six, I started wearing the hijab, headscarf covering, and when I went out in public, I was not allowed to go by myself. When I went out with my mother and my aunts, I had to wear this. This is called the abaya. This is traditional covering in my country and my culture. At the age of eight, my family and I decided to take a pilgrimage journey to Saudi Arabia, and we went to the city of Mecca to fulfill Hajj. Um, after we finished Hajj, we were going up north to the city of Medina. On the way there, suddenly a crowd started to gather. And I was with my father, and I was holding his hand. In the center of the crowd was an Arabic woman, dressed like this, but you could not see her face, her hands, or her feet. And she was sitting on a wooden box tied up. Next to her was an Arabic man, dressed in a traditional Arabic attire. He did a traditional Islamic prayer on the floor, and he got up from the floor, and he pulled out a long golden sword from his side, and he beheaded the woman. When I saw this at the age of eight, I started shaking with fear and anxiety that overcame me. And the commotion in the crowd, the men were chanting, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, three times, which is what is great. And the woman was screaming and crying. And I pulled my father's hand. I said, Father, what is happening? And my father said, we're trying to raise you in a devout Muslim home. You listen to the teachings we're instilling in your life. Live as a good Muslim and die as a good Muslim. If you don't do this, this is what will happen to you one day. After that, we went to Medina to fulfill prayer obligation at the mosque, and we went back home to Kuwait. My family enrolled my brother and I in an Islamic school, and that's where I learned more in-depth teaching from the Quran and the Hadith. You know, in my prayer times, I would lift up my hands, and I would always look to the sky and cry out to Allah for help. One of the important sincere prayer of my heart was, Allah, please have my father stop beating my mother. Allah, please have my father stop beating me that there was no help coming for me to answer all my prayers. I also wanted to Allah if I died, was I going to paradise? Because I tried to be a good Muslim. I tried to do everything I can to be a good Muslim. But there was no guarantee offered to me to go to paradise. I wanted to go be with Allah when I died. In uh, 1990, my family and I went to the United States for a visit. What I knew of America is what I saw on TV. You know, America is known as a Christian country to the Islamic world. So when we came to America, we were having a good visit. But we were woken up suddenly at night when we heard that Saddam Hussein's forces came and invaded the small country of Kuwait in the Middle East. There was a lot of destruction that happened within a short time. My country was, by the time we were watching, on fire. The oil fields were burning. People's home were destroyed. Uh, some, uh, some royal family members were killed. Our home was destroyed, but we had to stay in America. Now we are living in a foreign country with a foreign culture, with a foreign religion. I don't know anyone that looks like me, that even eats the same food I eat, or, or dresses like me, or sleep, speaks the same language. My life with Allah and Islam was very distant. My relationship with my family was conditional love, but the only support in my life that I really loved, my grandmother died. In Islam, when someone passes away, they offer no assurance and no guarantee to go to heaven. And I knew this. And I still prayed and cried out to Allah with tears in my eyes that he would have mercy over her soul. One day when I went to my job after the funeral, this lady came, to, came up to me and she found out that my grandmother died and she put her arms around me and gave me a hug. Do you know this hug gave me peace? I've never experienced this peace before. And then she asked me a question, would you like to go to church with me? Again, I've been living in America for eight and a half years as a Muslim. I drove by many churches. This was the first time I got invited to a big Christian church. When I walked into that church as a visible Muslim woman, the people in the church saw me and they came up to me and they looked me in the eye and they said, Hi, what is your name? Where are you from? Tell us about your family. And they took great interest in me. And then they said, We are so glad you're here. Thank you for coming. That day from these people, I felt a spirit of love and acceptance and mercy. 
that kind of spirit I've not experienced in my mosque before. In fact, there's a spirit of judgment in the mosque. For a Muslim, it's a duty to go pray in the mosque and hope that Allah will answer their prayers, hope that they will be acceptable in His eyes. But these people accepted me for who I was. I feel loved by these people. That is the first time I heard a message from the Bible from a pastor. It's from the prophet Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1. He said this is a prophecy of Jesus and he started reading that the Spirit of God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He came to heal the broken heart and set the captive free. In the book of Luke, where Jesus walks into the synagogue, he opened a scroll from prophet Isaiah and read the scripture and said, this is fulfilled. This is the first time I heard that Jesus came to this earth to heal the broken heart and set the captive free. In my religion, I was that. And, and even more. I wanted to know a creator God. I wanted to know a loving God and a merciful God. After that, the lady bought me a Bible as a gift and um, I started reading the Bible on my own. I had to hide it from my parents. I had put it in my mattress. But when I read the book of Exodus, how God sent Moses in to deliver and rescue the children of Israel, he even did miracles and to bring them into the land of promise. He provided them food and water in the desert. I come from the desert. There's no food and water there. But God provided for them because He loves them. He calls them His chosen people and the nation of Israel, His heartbeat. I started seeing that I hated the people that God loved so much. And I got on my knees and I said, God, forgive me. I hated your people. I want to love your people. After that, I read the Bible even more, and I started going to church and hiding. And a group of girls started explaining the Bible to me. And something started happening to me. My heart started changing. The blinders were falling off my eyes. I was loving all people. I was experiencing joy and happiness again. And one day came, the day that I was going to get baptized, I realized the decision I was going to make was a very important and permanent decision. But Jesus is the only God I found that is loving, caring, merciful, merciful, and giving, willing to give his life so I can have a life to follow a creator God. You know, I was so desperate to know a living God all my life that I was willing to give up my Islamic life to follow a new life in following Jesus as my Lord. That day, I rejected Islam, and I became a follower of Jesus. And I'm so excited to say that I have been a follower of Jesus now for years, and my life has changed. He came and set me free. He gave me a life of hope and a future in Him. I am filled with joy and happiness, and I love to serve my God. I want to go tell the nations that God came over 2,000 years ago to give them a hope and a future, and to heal them and restore them into His kingdom. Amen.